What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Aaron Nix, and I am back to discuss WWE NXT on the WrestleBlog YouTube channel. WWE NXT, of course, being very highly touted for me because this was the fallout from NXT Vengeance Day. Now, there were two things I was excited about. One was the Undisputed Era and what we were going to see going forward from them, and the other was Santos versus Killer Cross. I only got one of those, but I'm okay with it. Show open really nicely, actually. Carter Riley's in the ring. Very emotional. Very real, you know? Um, I was worried they might ham it up. I was worried that it might be a bit too over the top and, you know, dare I say, a little bit too AEW in a lot of ways. And that's not to say that AEW can't do good voice acting and, you know, talent, because, hello, Eddie Kingston. But... He's in the ring. He felt emotional. It felt real. He was like, I, why did you do this? Why did you break everything? Why did you ruin everything the way you did? You know, I want you to come out here and explain yourself. And maybe you might have a good reason for kicking me in the mouth. But ultimately, I'm going to punch you in the mouth. Roderick Strong then comes down. I love Carla Raleigh's mannerisms because he's like, I'm not interested in seeing you. Where the fuck is Adam? He even drops what I think was an F-bomb. Fantastic. It just felt real. It felt organic. It felt interesting. Uh, then, of course, Finn Balor comes down. And he's like, you're not Adam Cole either. And I love Finn Balor's response because Finn Balor's like, oh, oh, you're looking for Adam Cole? So am I, dickhead, because I've got a whopping great mark career where he kicked me in the face and all. So get in line, sunshine. And then, of course, before you get any kind of resolution, out come the bad boys themselves. Pat McAfee's brand. Pete Dunne comes down, obviously, with the boys. Lads, lads, lads. Danny Birch, Only Lorcan, they kick ass. And then all of a sudden, that pretty much sets up the main event for the night, which is going to be a six-man tag. Excellent. We'll see you boys later for the continuation of the breakup of the Undisputed Era. It's actually quite emotional. <laughs> it is quite depressing in a way, because I thought these boys were going to be in it forever. And I love the fact that Carla Rod even said that in the promo. He even said, like, we we promised each other we weren't going to be this way, and you've ruined it. But, oh man, I'm so excited about the continuation of this. And by the way, it's a slow burn. We don't need everything given away. I've seen some people on social media, so wait, what a minute, are like, oh, he's undisputed here, done or not? And it's like, patience. It's been like three days. I mean, it's pretty evident anyway, but let the story be told. You wouldn't read the first two pages of the book and go, yeah, no, I'm bored now. Get to the end. Flip forward to page 347. <laughs> That's not how that works. But this NXT was great. It had really good pacing as well. Everything just seemed to line up really nicely. And of course, one thing that I love about NXT continuation and good use of their women's division. Casey Catanzaro, for instance, she's out there with Caden Carter. She's uh, getting ready to take part in this tag team match. They obviously have a, a fairly competitive match for the most part with Aaliyah and Jesse, who seems to be part of the Robert Stone brand, which I've got to be honest, I'm not interested in at all. And then out comes Ailee, and of course last week, Caitlin Carter had kind of got her ass handed to her. By the way, can I just say, I haven't had a chance to mention this enough on our YouTube channel, I really think that Caden Carter and Casey Catanzaro are really good at promos. They're backstage stuff when they're kind of leaning on each other, being kind of cute, giving each other the nudge. They're really good talkers, actually. And now they have an opportunity to flex themselves storyline-wise, because Ailee comes down with her... <sighs> What can only be described as a cosplay of Seraph from The Matrix. Uh, that'll be one for the nerds out there. Uh, she comes down and she marks Casey Catanzaro and she says, next week, I'm going to purge you. Bit drastic, mate. It's just an ass kicking would be fine. Purging? Bit much. <laughs> so it is what it is. But that obviously sets it up nicely. See what I mean? So simple. What did that take? About a minute or so. She comes down, she marks her, says, I'll see you next week for a match. And instantaneously, you're thinking, shit, I wonder what they're going to do. Could be quite cool. One of the absolute highlights of the night has to be the trophy presentation of sorts of the Dusty Classic winner. So here comes MSK with Beth Phoenix in the ring to interview them. And of course, here comes Dakota Kai and Raquel Gonzalez as well. Very much quickly, straight after them actually. MSK barely had a chance to breathe and hype up the fact that March the 3rd's episode of NXT will see MSK face only Lorcan and Danny Burch for the tag titles. Now on the flip side of things, on that very same night... 
the women, who, by the way, absolutely took control of this segment and proved why women's wrestling is the very best it is right now. And frankly, NXT has the best women's division in the world. And if anyone disagrees with that, they're stupid. It's as simple as that. But this segment proved it beautifully. Raquel Gonzalez and Dakota Kai are in the ring. They don't get a chance to celebrate that fact because obviously here comes Shayna Baszler and Nia Jax. And wow, when they come out on Raw and SmackDown, I think, mean, who cares? When it came out on NXT, they felt slightly bigger. They felt like stars, which was kind of cool. And that shows you that even if you're not doing very well on the main roster, you still have a certain amount of gravitas. They come down, they square up, and then all of a sudden, great mic work. Where's this Shayna Baszler and Ajax on Raw? Where are they? <laughs> they? They get on the mic. They're good. They're fluent. I love the fact that every single woman was mentioned in Dusty Rhodes. And of course, the whole thing... <laughs> is absolutely punctuated beautifully by MSK, who for some reason have managed to find popcorn, which they're sharing with Beth Phoenix, and they're doing the whole kind of like Michael Jackson New Day gift thing with that. <laughs> I thought it was fucking hysterical. Sorry, AEW Dynamite, but you don't have MSK eating popcorn in the corner while the women are kicking the shit out of each other. So that's a minus one for you this week. Uh, I thought it was really good fun. And of course, the promo is fantastic. Dakota Kai is such a different person from the woman who had her arm broken by Shayna Baszler in storylines way back when. And she pointed out, she said, I'm going to kick your head off. And I love that record. Gonzalez is like, oh, Nia Jax, you're a big bitch. Bitch, I'm bigger. <laughs> and the woman that chased off Shayna Baszler, Rhea Ripley, well, I whooped her ass too. I love that. And the way she was kind of dropping in the little sort of Latin mannerisms as well. Oh, spicy. And I'm very excited about this. All of a sudden, the... All of a sudden, this feels like genuinely the best fucking contenders they've had for these tag titles in God knows how long. How can you not be excited? March the 3rd is going to be lit as fuck. I am very excited about the episode of NXT and I love this segment and it really made a stamp of approval on these women and it also made a statement by saying yeah these women are genuinely some of the best in the world and we're going to give them the opportunity to show why they are the best in the world. Loved it. Absolutely spot on. I thought it was a fantastic segment and the use of the women continued as well. We got Zoe Stark making her singles debut. Wow. Uh, we didn't really get much look at her other than, of course, a fleeting appearance in the Dusty Classic. Tell you what, what a specimen. Powerhouse. Interesting the way Barrett referred to her as a, like Shakira, but more angry and more put together. I was like, okay. <laughs> A bit random. And then he somehow tried to sing Shakira on commentary. Like, yeah, no, we, we won't do any of that. Can I just say, Wade Barrett has been... He's been a revelation on this show. He was fantastic when he was a part of the uh, the World of Sport rerun that they did over here on ITV, which, of course, we covered for the podcast. We had a great time watching that. It was really good fun. And he has just been an absolutely lights out revelation for NXT and him and Vic Joseph and Beth Phoenix just feel like a genuine organic trio of commentators that works so well in so many ways and if you look at the other trios not just AEW who I harp on about because I feel like the legend status of JR kind of precedes him too much at this point but even on Raw for instance I like Tom Phillips but I'm really getting fed up with Tom Phillips, Samajo and Byron Saxton mostly because of Byron Saxton and, you know, obviously SmackDown's got the two-man booth, but everywhere where you look where there's a three-man or three-person commentary team, this is by far and away the best. I'm sorry, but it is. It just is, as far as I'm concerned. Um, even the more underutilized talents were used well on here. What I like about this, right, uh, I use AEW as a comparison because they're very much in a similar kind of vein to NXT in a lot of things they do. It's not necessarily a case of me just using this as an opportunity to take cheap shots. Case in point with AEW, they've got AEW Dark, right? Now, that's okay. And the whole format of that show is, here's some jobbers or some undercarders getting walloped by some main roster guys. And NXT has a similar principle in so many ways, but obviously they don't use another program, they just have the one. So, Kashida's backstage, okay? Now, he's just come off of a big loss against Johnny Gargano. And, you know, he's backstage, he's in the trainer's room, so to speak. And... The interviewer comes in, she asks him how he's feeling, all of a sudden there's a guy reading a paper in the background, it's Malcolm Bivens, which I thought was great because he just goes, yeah, <laughs> I, just, I just thought it was really funny and I thought if they zoom in on that, you've got an absolute meme-tastic wonder moment there, that is so good. Uh, he obviously comes over and goes, yeah, you know, it was impressive what you did this weekend, but I tell you what, 
what would be really impressive is if just three days removed from that, you wrestled my client, Tyler Rust, who's a diamond in the rust. See what he did there? Yeah, we, we get it, okay? It's, it's all right. Can I just say, Malcolm Bivens, why is he not used more? He's so funny and so entertaining and so good on the mic, so fluent in the way he speaks. Obviously, we remember him as Stokely Halfway from Evolve. He's got so much potential as a big-time manager. You see what MVP's doing with Hurt Business and Raw. I think Malcolm Bivens can go much further than that. He is such a natural talker, and he is just brimming with charisma. I mean, he's getting tired of Rust over, and nobody has a fucking clue who tired of Rust is. Um... But even in that segment, Bronson Reed comes over. Just to let you know, I've got my eyes on the North American Championship. And obviously, if you get in my way, well, we'll worry about that when it comes down to it. But he gives him a fist bump and walks off. And you think, that's it. That's all I needed. It doesn't have to be overly convoluted. He doesn't need to be in a 15-minute match on Dark or, you know, or on Raw or whatever it might be. Simple. Simple and effective. Speaking of Johnny Gargano, by the way, who I mentioned just a moment ago, uh, <laughs> he's out of ringside because where is Austin Theory? Can I just say, NXT doesn't get enough credit for the little things it does. So Austin Theory got abducted uh, at Vengeance Day by the lunatic serial killer that is Dexter Loomis. And literally, as soon as he got abducted, like I think about a couple of hours later, his profile picture changed to Dexter Loomis going like, was <laughs> fucking great um you know there was just nothing really going on there was just it was brilliant it just felt genuinely like Dexter Loomis had abducted him so of course the way are out here they're like where is he what the hell's going on I love the way they're saying like, we've lost our our fourth man our brethren where is he of course Indy Hartwell and Candice LeRae uh taking on the team of Shotzi Blackheart and Ember Moon who are just coming off of a loss in the Dusty Classic final of course so not only was it a really good use of everyone involved but it was a really great way to have a little bit of crossover because you needed to figure out a way obviously to use Ember Moon and Shotzi Black can't keep them relevant as a tag team I like the fact that just because the Dusty Classic is done doesn't mean that these tag teams can't continue and it was great to see them wrestle again same with Casey Catanzaro and Caden Carter they okay just because Dusty Classic is done doesn't mean that we can just ignore tag team wrestling and I like that. That's a good brand of continuity for me. And of course, it follows up nicely because during this match, obviously Johnny Gargano sees the white vampire. He's like, what the fuck is this all about? Goes outside and then turns out he must have found Austin Fury in there because he brings Austin Fury out at the end of the match. Now, obviously, because of that distraction, Ember Moon and Shotzi Blackheart get the win. But it kind of works out for everyone because it's like, we've got Austin Fury back. And I love that Austin Fury's in his pants. He's got he's tied up he's got a fucking fanny pack no idea what's going on there but i'm sure they will explain it at some point but i thought it was great stuff i really did sitting in the mid card quite nicely as well was leon ruff versus swerve uh leon ruff getting another upset win swerve has pretty much become heel now he's become the self-entitled prick it was a great match actually really underappreciated underrated it's the kind of match where if it had been on impact or aw people would be raving about it but because it's on a big wwe platform nobody wants to pay attention or give it any props but both guys are actually really great wrestlers. I feel like Swerve has more of an upside. Leon Ruff's gimmick essentially is that he's a bit of a bitch. You know, he's very talented, but he's a bit of a bitch. And he gets walloped around. And he's the plucky underdog. Reminds me a lot, actually, of Colin Delaney. Who remembers Colin Delaney? Shout out in the comments if you remember Colin Delaney. But it was a good match. I thought it was fine. Uh, Leon Ruff getting the upset win is a bit annoying because you feel like Swerve deserves a little bit more. And obviously Swerve snaps at the end beats the shit out of him and says i'm sick and tired of you getting opportunities that i don't get cool and that leaves the main event of the evening undisputed eras kyle o'reilly and roderick strong the brothers that seem to be breaking up tagging up with finn balor to take on pete dunn only Lorcan and Danny Birch. And of course, we saw a little promo as well, which was fantastic of Pat McAfee just sitting in a plane going, hey guys, hey, remember me? And he just keeps calling the IWC out and basically slagging off fat internet fans like myself. Two dirty thumbs up. Always appreciate a good heel promo. By the way, Pat McAfee, right? He cut a promo on a plane uh, for about a minute of TV program, and it was better than most of the promos that you get from like Raw and AEW Dynamite and other shows. Well, 
Oof. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it is what it is. This main event was great, but obviously it wasn't going to be nearly as complex and exciting and five-star worthy as Pete Dunne versus Finn Balor, because the whole idea was the device and the plot device of what's going on in the Undisputed Era. And we kind of got an answer, really, because obviously during the match, great psychology, by the way. Don't need to have 5,000 flips to show off a good storyline. What I loved about this was the fact that constantly they're refusing to tag each other in. Carlo Riley doesn't trust Roderick Strong. He made that very clear early in the night. I love the little bit of this as well. The, the entrance, he's doing the like, you know, the little Undisputed Era thing. And Carlo Riley just kind of storms past him like, yeah, I'm not doing that. Fuck off. I don't trust you, mate. Brilliant. Love stuff like that. So simple and yet so effective. I like it when they don't insult the wrestling fans' intelligence. And they do do that a lot in WWE, but on NXT they don't. They were just like, we're going to leave it up to you. We're going to see whether you spot during the match that, you know, Kyler Riley will only tag in Finn Balor. And that kind of feels like a storyline within itself. Has Adam Cole turned because he's fed up with Kyler Riley's man crush with Adam Cole? What's Roderick Strong going to do? Does he notice that there's a disconnect? You know, it, all these little things that go in really nicely. Roderick Strong. Beth Phoenix hammering home on commentary as well that Roderick Strong needs to prove himself, which I don't personally agree with, but it's brilliant because you might fall on one side of that fence or the other. And of course, right near the end of the match, the referee gets knocked down. You think, here comes the shenanigans. And Adam Cole turns up out of nowhere while everybody's laid out. And he just fucking kicks Kyle Riley in the face. And suplexes him onto the steel steps. And you think, why? Why are you doing this to me, man? Why why are you breaking my heart like this? Why you gotta why you gotta do me like this, Adam? <laughs> Carl O'Reilly's laying there static. Adam Cole seems to disappear, at least you think. Pete Dunn picks up a fucking pretty important win, actually pinning the WWE NXT champion, which is very interesting to see. And then of course. Kyle O'Reilly, you know, he's laid out. Finn Balor at the end, he's kind of like standing there thinking, what the fuck? Puts his belt over his shoulder, turns around, boom, another super kick from Adam Cole. And Adam Cole just picks up his belt and NXT goes off the air with him just holding that belt up by a prone Finn Balor. And you think, money. <laughs> That's what I thought, money. Well done, lads. Simple, effective, brilliant. What did you think of NXT, guys? I loved it. I loved how easy it was. I loved how simple it was. I loved the pacing of it. Very interested to see what AEW Dynamite is like. I will be reviewing that as well. So keep an eye out on the channel for that. And by the way, you might want to check out the Option C video that we dropped a couple of days ago. Because there's a little surprise in there for everybody. But for myself, Aaron Nix, thank you very much for watching. And we'll catch you very soon for more content from the Wrestle Plug.